Hi everyone, Assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you very much for uh, coming and listening today. Uh, before we uh, start the main program, um, we have a recitation of Quran from Khadija Glamsain. <laughs> والذي أنزل من السماء ماء لكم منه شراب ومنه شجر شجر فيه تسيمون ينبت لكم به الزرع والزيتون والنخيل والعناب ومن كل الثمرات إن في ذلك لآية لقوم يتفكرون وسخر لكم الليل والنها والشمس والقمر والنجوم مسخرات بأمره إن في ذلك لآيات قوم يعقلون وما ذرأ لكم في الأرض مختلفا ألوانه إن في ذلك لآيات قوم يذكرون وهو الذي سخر البحر لتأكلوا منه لحما طريا وتستخرجوا, وتستخرجوا منه حنية تلبسونها وترى الفلك مواخر فيه ولتبتغوا من فضله ولعلهم, ولعلكم تشكرون وألقى في الأرض رواسي أن تميد بكم وأنهار وسبلا لعلكم تهتدون وعلى وعلامات وبالنجم هم يهتدون صدق الله العلي العظيم Thank you very much, Khadija, for, for that recitation. Uh, we, uh, I think we uh, would have the translation which might have come on the screen, I'm not sure, but um, in any case, uh, we are now very fortunate to have Professor Clarence Smith, who will be uh, speaking to us about Islam and slavery. Um, uh, professor Clarence Smith is, an, uh, is a professor, obviously, uh, of Economic History of Asia and Africa at SOAS and a fellow of the Ro Royal Asiatic Cent um, Society and the Royal Historical Society. Um, he has released, um, sorry, um, sorry, he, his title is actually Emeritus Professor of History at SOAS. Um, he is currently, he's a member of the London Middle East Institute, the Centre for Iranian Studies, the Centre for Palestinian Studies, and the Centre for Gender Studies at the University of London. And he's known for his research into the history of religion, slavery, and gender norms. Um, he's uh, released a book this year, and hopefully he'll be talking to us about Islam and slavery and giving us new insights. So, um, and without further ado, uh, Professor Darren Smith. Well, thank you very much indeed uh, for this opportunity. Um, I'm actually talking about the abolition of slavery, uh, which is often seen in Islamic context as being either imposed by Western colonialists uh, or carried out by Muslim secularists uh, copying the West. And so my um, 2006 book, uh, which has just come out in, in paperback from Hearst, uh, attempts to demonstrate that there's actually a an, um, an interior story of specifically Islamic uh, abolitionism. I, I'm also uh, trying, although more speculatively, to compare and contrast the Islamic experience with that of other religions. Slavery has been uh, very important in all world religions for centuries, but it's always been contested. Um, my argument is that the contestation of slavery in Islam is relatively precocious compared to other world religions, but that Islam often clings on to slavery longer than other world religions. So there's a kind of paradoxical uh, tension uh, in that relationship. So if we start with the uh, Quran, um, slavery was not taken for granted, but neither was it explicitly uh, forbidden. And when the Prophet began to preach in Mecca, uh, many of his original adherents were slaves, uh, and some of these were singled out for persecution by the Meccans because they were more vulnerable um, than, than other adherents uh, of the Prophet. We also have sort of straws in the wind. There's a hadith from the period in Medina uh, 
which tells of Fatima, Muhammad's daughter, uh, asking for a slave woman to relieve her of her domestic chores and receiving the answer that she would do better to pray. Uh, there were repeated exhortations in the Quran to manumit uh, slaves. Uh, and of course, if that had been followed in a massive way, it could have led ipso facto uh, to the institution uh, dying out uh, within uh, the Islamic uh, community. Uh, instead of which, what we get is a maintenance of slavery, although in slightly different forms to what had existed before. Um, and the most frequently cited uh, text uh, in the Quran is 47.4 or 47.45 in some uh, versifications. Uh, when you, this is Arbery's translation. When you meet the unbelievers, smite their necks. Then when you have made wide slaughter among them, tie fast the bonds. Then set them free, either by grace or ransom, till the war lays down its loads. And when you look at that text, you're actually quite surprised that it should be cited as a justification uh, for slavery because it sounds like a command to free prisoners uh, of war. But the early Islamic jurists uh, nullified that particular interpretation, uh, either through the catch-all concept of maslaha, of public interest, if not in the public interest of the Muslims to free captives, or more, in a more complicated manner by the abrogation uh, of 47.4 by sword, so-called sword verses in the Quran, which were revealed to the Prophet at a later period. Um, and according to this interpretation, then sparing the lives of slaves, of oh, sorry, sparing the lives of captives, was a magnanimous uh, gesture instead of uh, killing them. In addition, there are passages in both Quran and Hadiths which presuppose the existence of slavery. Uh, indeed, as manumission is the only prescribed way of atoning for certain uh, sins, some ulama have long uh, fretted as to what would happen if there were no longer any slaves left uh, to free. And in fact, this argument, interestingly, is still cited today, so it's not just an old one. In effect, what happened then, um, I argue, is that a compromise was reached, but a fragile compromise uh, by around 800 of the common era, so after about 200 years uh, of um, Islamic history. Uh, the ulama basically took freedom to be the norm. Right? And importantly, with no exceptions for foundlings, that children who were abandoned, or debtors, uh, or criminals. So in that sense, this was a, a change from earlier situations where these groups of people had been considered to be enslavable. The only two explicitly legitimate ways of enslaving people were the capture of obdurate infidels in holy war, We'll come back to those complicated definitions, and birth to a slave mother. And as many people know, uh, even in, in the uh, latter case, uh, a concubine who, uh, whose master acknowledged a child's paternity became numwalad, she could not be sold, and she was to be freed at her master's death. But the most important thing to stress, I think, is that conversion to Islam after enslavement did not guarantee liberty. This was exactly the same in the Christian side. Conversion to Christianity was no passport to liberty in Christianity either. However, manumitting slaves was a pious act, especially manumitting Muslim slaves. Uh, and owners had to free their slaves if they wanted to marry them, which is a rather special subcategory. Sharia law also set out the humane treatment of slaves in fine detail, um, about a third of the Hidayah compilation of um, Sharia law is about how you treat slaves. Uh, although there are historically problems of enforcement, particularly with the inviolability of the uh, Muslim home. Now, although I say that this compromise was reached, in reality, it's never really accepted. Long after the so-called gates of interpretation are shut, the uh, ulama continue to debate and to be uncertain about slavery. It's one of these issues which consensus is never really entirely reached. So some uh, ulama concentrated in particular, and not just ulama, also Muslim faithful, concentrated on the whole question of whether it was acceptable for somebody to be a slave and a Muslim. Right? Um, and this was particularly a problem for slaves who were born of enslaved Muslim parents. But it was also a problem for slaves who converted after converted to Islam after being uh, enslaved, because there was a sort of tension between the notion of the equality of believers before God uh, and the social inequality 
uh, of servitude. And what's interesting about this is that this question about can one be a Muslim slave was often posed to muftis. And a lot of the information that we have is in fact the, the, the fatawa that uh, muftis would give uh, on this complicated topic. There's also the problem of how, how people are made into slaves um, and these critiques could be quite minor and technical, but they could also become so all embracing that what you get is what I've called quasi abolitionism in certain cases in Islam, where in effect what people are saying is that no new slaves should be accepted because the methods of making them slaves are all wrong. You'll remember that uh, enslavement in a holy war or a jihad of the sword uh, of obdurate in infidels, that is those who refuse the summons to convert, but this raised a whole series of, of thorny um, definitions. What is a holy war, right? What is a properly constituted holy war? Uh, in the Shia tradition, can you have a holy war after the 12th Imam uh, has been uh, occulted? Uh, and all sorts of complicated Shia debates uh, around that. But even if you have a holy war, can you enslave people of the book? Now, who are people of the book? Initially, the people of the book were uh, Christians and Jews, but over time, the definition of people of the book really slipped completely towards the notion of anybody who accepted Muslim rule uh, was, uh, was not enslavable and became people of the book by kind of extension of the notion. Even more problematic, could you enslave bad Muslims, particularly people who were called apostates? It's often said that Muslims never enslaved other Muslims. And that's not true. They enslaved lots of other Muslims. But you did it by calling your enemies apostates, false Muslims, bad Muslims, people who've given up Islam. And of course, they might have a different opinion um, on that. Even bigger problem was that the basic texts of Islam said nothing about buying slaves or acquiring them through tribute. And so you get lots and lots of writings about whether uh, the laws and the wars of infidels were such as to legitimately constitute people as slaves who would then be sold uh, to the Muslims. And most slaves were bought after a certain period, after the initial period of conquest, most of the new slaves were purchased. Um, in addition, we do get divisions between different kinds of Muslims. The first uh, Muslim critics of slavery after the period of the rightly guided uh, caliphs were typically millenarians in the Ismaili tradition. Uh, and the one unambiguous process of abolition uh, was enacted by the Druze, the so-called Druze, they call themselves Muwahidun, uh, Unitarians, uh, in the 11th century. Um, but although this is a very interesting case, it has no obvious consequences for the majority of Muslims because the Druze are often considered not to be Muslims and are certainly seen as a very strange uh, and weird sect, even if they are seen as, as Muslims. A second wave of unhappiness with slavery occurred in the so-called gunpowder empires from the 16th century of the common era, the Ottomans, the Mughals, and the Safavids especially, and the Moroccan empire. Um, and many of the reformers at that stage whether the rulers themselves or their advisors were interested in um, reducing the power of elite slaves, of eunuchs uh, and other powerful uh, court slaves. And uh, this is always explained in, in Western texts as being because these people become too powerful. You actually get in the Ottoman case, the Sultanate of the eunuchs. Um, but I think this, this really underestimates the desire of the rulers and of their um, Islamic advisors uh, to be in conformity with the Sharia. There is a real sort of sense that is slavery, is certain forms of slavery anyway, in conformity with the Sharia. Uh, Akbar the Great in Mughal India uh, even contested uh, enslavement uh, through war, uh, possibly to head off damaging rebellions by his non-Muslim subjects. Now the overall effects of these doubts, and they are, they are important doubts, I think, but the overall effects were very minor. In other words, there's very little change uh, in the acquisition of slaves uh, in the early modern period. So we move to the next period, which is the pressure from Western powers. Now Westerners themselves had of course had vast numbers of slaves, including a large number of uh, white uh, Muslim slaves who are often forgotten. Um, but from the late 18th century, for reasons which are still very controversial, Westerners came to question slavery on both Christian grounds, 
but also on secular grounds. And those two actually need to be carefully separated out. And at the same time, they, begin, they began to press much more heavily on the Islamic world as the Islamic world began to collapse in uh, political terms and you get the spread of Western uh, colonialism. Now, violently enforced colonial abolition in Muslim lands, Muslim colonies, often led to rebellions uh, in the name of defending the Sharia against the infidels uh, meddling. An example which I've worked on is in the United States in the southern Philippines, having taken over the Philippines from Spain, um, imposed a, a quite violent form of uh, colonial abolition uh, in the southern Muslim areas. But over time, more and more Muslims came to accept that servitude was wrong and a new argument that it may even have contributed to the Islamic community's weakness, one of the reasons why they were in such trouble with the West. Now, for some Muslims, this, this change in view uh, resulted from quite Western notions of rationality and economic efficiency. But for others, and they're the ones I'm really interested in, um, they, they held that slavery was a deviation from the path of God, i.e. from the true Sharia. So we get the emergence of a specifically Islamic discourse on abolition. Uh, and the most influential of, these of the radical reformers was um, Sayyid Ahmad Khan in British India, who has been called the Islamic William Wilberforce. And he put forward strongly abolitionist ideas from the 1870s, uh, which are very radical because they say that slavery had always been wrong in Islam from the very beginning. In other words, Muslims had disobeyed their prophet, had disobeyed their God um, by maintaining this institution, which was illegitimate. And um, Ahmad Khan uh, influenced the, the Tatars of the Russian Empire, Muslim Tatars of the Russian Empire, who were other precocious reformers denouncing slavery and who had some impact in the uh, Ottoman Empire. At the same time, we get another Sayyid, another son of the Prophet, Amir Ali, of uh, Shi'i origins in British India, who developed a much more gradualist and rationalist critique uh, of slavery. In other words, it's not that slavery had always been wrong, but that the time was now ripe to fulfill the desire of the Prophet, the ultimate intention of the Prophet and of God, that slavery should eventually disappear within the community of believers. This is this sort of Indian South Asian Tatar um, anti-slavery uh, discourse is then reinforced from around 1900 by Muhammad Abdu, the Grand Mufti of uh, Egypt, uh, who had a really good network of liberal modernist um, is, uh, Muslims throughout the world, uh, particularly through the journal uh, Al Manar, the, the lighthouse published in, in Cairo. In addition to these um, opponents of slavery, we get occasional millenarian leaders denouncing slavery because they saw the millennium was coming, the end of the world, uh, the Mahdi would come and would uh, bring justice where there had been injustice before. Um, and part of that injustice was sometimes equated with slavery. For example, I uh, put in my book, the Satiru group in Northern Nigeria, where the Sokoto Caliphate had been set up uh, in the um, 18th and 19th century. Abolitionist Sufism was rather slower to develop, but one also gets a, a kind of Sufi uh, version of this. Um, and it was eventually embodied in the notion of the very controversial notion, I hasten to add, of the second message of Islam, uh, which was propounded by uh, Mahmoud Muhammad Taha in, in the Sudan, in the Nilotic Sudan, um, until he was executed. Uh, by the regime for apostasy in, in 1985. And the second message of Islam, it has a, it's a typically Sufi idea in the sense that there's an esoteric uh, underlying message which was not given initially, but which was kind of given for those who could understand it, so to speak, uh, which was more liberal, more um, et cetera, et cetera. And which, again, the idea was that the time had now come for the second message. Uh, to um, be executed, and uh, this would include the abolition of slavery. So with this assault on slavery coming from Islamic roots, coming through an, an expression of Islamic ideas and with a recourse to Islamic texts, uh, when can one say that most Muslims, if you like, decided that slavery was, was wrong? Um, it's very, very difficult to pinpoint this. Uh, Khalid Abu al-Fadl, uh, writing around the turn of the present millennium, held that, and I quote, 
Uh, Muslims of previous generations reached the awareness that slavery is immoral and unlawful as a matter of conscience, end of quote. But unfortunately, he doesn't state when he thought that this had occurred. Um, it's certainly by the 1960s, uh, that's quite late, that's quite surprisingly late in a sense, but by the 1960s, uh, we get a, a new consensus uh, fairly generally uh, held in Islamic uh, areas and very much informed by um, Sayyid Amir Ali's gradualist approach more than by um, Sayyid Ahmed Khan's more radical approach uh, to um, abolition, although the two notions were, were both current. And the organization of the Islamic Conference, which is, I suppose, one of the few organizations which kind of brings Muslims together on a kind of global scale, uh, financed a conference on human rights in Belgrade in 1980, uh, together with UNESCO, uh, which clearly rejected the enslavement of prisoners and conquered peoples. And in 1990, the Organization of the Islamic Conference published the Cairo Declaration on Human Rights in Islam. Article 11a stated that, I quote, human beings are born free and no one has the right to enslave, humiliate, oppress or exploit them, end of quote. Unfortunately though, um, the, the declaration still stressed that all human rights are subject to uh, the authority of the um, Sharia. So this was slightly less absolute uh, rejection uh, than might appear at, at first uh, glance. Moreover, um, some Muslims continued to reject this new consensus um, and we get a, a, a mixture of phenomena, one of which is the persistence of manifestations of bondage uh, in very well, fairly remote areas. Uh, the example of Mauritania is very often cited in Western Africa uh, Mauritania has abolished slavery four times, um, and in a sense, if you you know if you need to abolish slavery four times, there's something not working uh, with the the process of abolition. But one could argue that these these forms of uh, of persistence of slavery in very remote areas are not terribly significant. I'm not saying that they're, they're right, but they're not terribly significant. I think more problematic is the fact that we get some urban Muslims or Muslims living in core countries. Um, who still call uh, today for the restoration of slavery because it's part of God's law and what God has instituted, uh, no human being uh, can um, abolish. So you can see immediately that this is a literalist or fundamentalist or Islamist perspective, whichever way you like to uh, define it. Uh, basically, uh, the letter of the law uh, must be followed. And this has become uh, a kind of contemporary problem or at least it's, it's, this has been highlighted by Islamic State or Daesh or um, whatever particular term you use for the group um, where in, in Iraq uh, they uh, enslaved a number of uh, Yazidi, um, Yazidi, I don't quite know where the stress lies, um, who were defined as devil worshippers uh, and therefore not as people of the book. So they were removed from the notion that people of the book uh, should be protected uh, from uh, enslavement. This is, of course, is highly problematic because, like the Druze, the Yazidi would um, claim to, well, some of them anyway, or might claim to be Muslims uh, of a certain kind. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm really trying to argue in this book uh, is that the, the history of quasi-abolition in Islam is a very long one, and it's one which has been of great interest to um, scholars. Uh, who've um, picked and unpicked uh, the texts and looked at what the ulama have said. Um, and this is all very interesting as an intellectual exercise. But ultimately, it seems to me that quasi-abolition rarely had much social impact. In other words, if we're trying to see how many um, people were not enslaved because of these debates, um, the answer is probably very few. There are one or two exceptions to this, one or two cases in which uh, some of these debates uh, may have had uh, a bit more impact, but basically it, there's a lot of talk and not much action. Now, in contrast, I would argue that the history of Islamic abolitionism, abolitionism sorry, uh, since the 1870s uh, has attracted much less uh, scholarly attention. Um, and yet, arguably, this has been much more effective. Um, and what I mean by this is that um, it's not so much that 
the arguments of Islamic abolitionists since the 1870s have resulted in Islamic uh, regimes, Islamic governments abolishing slavery, because that actually is fairly rare. Right? And if you look at independent Islamic states which abolished slavery, like the, um, the Persian state uh, in 1929, uh, what's striking usually, not always, but usually what's striking about these forms of abolition uh, is the very secular language uh, in which the texts are, are couched. So this is a matter of secular law, uh, not a matter of uh, Islamic uh, interpretation. But where I think that the arguments of the Islamic abolitionists since the 1870s have been really important um, has been in making formal legal abolition uh, socially acceptable. In other words, it's it's meant that people can actually um, not just flout the law or not just say, well, we obey the law because we have to, because otherwise we'll be shot or something, but we don't believe it to be right. But people have, over time, Muslims have over time generally moved towards a notion that the law is actually right and that it is actually the right thing to do. Even if it's a colonial law, it's actually the right thing to do, uh, not to have slavery anymore. And that incredible change, I think, was brought about by the rise of Islamic abolitionism. No amount of preaching by Christian missionaries or colonial uh, officials or administrators was ever going to uh, achieve that change. That change came through internal um, discourses of abolition by Muslims based on their own traditions and on their own reading of the holy texts. So I think paradoxically that these latter day abolitionists who at first sight seem to have had very little impact, uh, in reality had a much greater impact uh, on the lived uh, realities uh, of slavery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that, that was very interesting. And uh, we do have uh, time for questions now um, from, from the audience. Um, if anyone does have a question in the Zoom call, please feel free to put your hand up or uh, send a note on the chat. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, feel free to send a, a message or, or put a note on the uh, question on the actual page it's, um, on the YouTube chat as well. Um, firstly, let's start um, a message or, or put a note on the uh, question on the actual yeah, page. Sorry. Um, sorry. Um, so if you'd like to start with um, uh, Iqbal Asari, I don't know if you want to ask it directly, so I'm going to ask if you would like to unmute yourself. Okay. okay. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Smith, for this uh, very interesting insight into the thing. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, Muhammad Abdu. Have you any information on the stance of, uh, say, Jamaluddin Afghani on this uh, subject? Um, that's an interesting question. I've looked very hard for what Afghani might have to say about it, and I've not found uh, anything. Um, how close the relations between uh, Afghani and Abdul really were is, is actually itself an interesting question too. But uh, no, uh, what I found is essentially coming from Abdul and from some of his other disciples. Yeah. Right, okay. Because as you say, I mean, it is, this is not a sectarian divide uh, in the sense that Amir Ali, for example, and Sayyid Ahmad Khan from different sides yeah. And the same thing in different ways. So it's not because Afghani was a Shi'i that he wouldn't have taken any stance. But as you said, there is no, I haven't found any evidence. So I thought maybe you have uncovered something. Because they were quite, uh, I mean, in Al Manar, they were participating quite uh, actively. So I don't know. Yes, I mean, I get the impression Afghani was much more of a a political animal. He was much more interested in um, in political change than in religious change. Whereas Abdu actually, I think, was not terribly interested in politics and was much more of a, a classic alim. I mean, he really was somebody who was interested in religion. Yeah. I think that makes it quite a difference, actually. Okay. Yeah. Because I remember even now, lately, in the time of Zia ul Haq, in Pakistan, yes. and said to abolish slavery, some of the ulama said you can't because it is ordained, you can't just touch it. Yes. So, I mean, that yes. argument, as you say, it's still ongoing. It's not yes. it's not dying out in the sense that everybody says, okay, this is finished. Mm -hmm. And in, in Saudi Arabia, you have a, a, a complicated situation because essentially slavery was abolished um, by a secular decree uh, 
uh, by the Amir, by the, um, by the Saudi monarch. Um, and many of the ulama in Saudi Arabia have never accepted that. They've said, you know, he has no jurisdiction um, over these things. Thank you. Um, uh, another question that's come through. How does your work differ from Jonathan Brown's on this topic? <laughs> um, uh, well, Jonathan Brown's book is sitting in a big pile of things that I've got to review, uh, and I haven't yet got uh, round to reading it. Um, so, I'm uh, sorry, that's, uh, that's a bit of a cop-out, but I'm not actually sure how my view differs from his view. Great, no worries. Um, uh, the next question is, on, is there a difference in terms of how concubine slavery in um, within uh, the, the discourse and the change in abolitionism or have they entirely together? Um, yes and no. In other words, concubinage, um, like eunuchs, um, they have separate um, debates about them, uh, which don't run entirely in parallel with the general debate. In other words, it was sometimes uh, seen, actually it's more for eunuchs than for concubines, perhaps. It was sometimes seen as, as really wrong uh, to uh, have eunuchs. And eunuchs had to be slaves in Islamic law, although there are some examples of non-servile uh, eunuchs. But um, th so that debate was fairly autonomous. And there is a kind of earlier rejection of eunuchs and to some extent of concubines, uh, even before a more general onslaught on slavery. So the debates uh, us are, are actually, they're, they're intertwined, but they're not exactly the same. Um, thank you. Um, uh, I'm just reading one out from YouTube. Uh, so it says, you mentioned that it was the prophet in God's aim to abolish slavery. It suggested the, that the OIC's 1990 declaration on human rights wasn't sufficient as it was still bound to the rules of Sharia. What part of the Sharia is it not in line with? How does that work? Well, um, in a sense, I think what happened in 1990 was a big struggle between the people who participated in drawing up that uh, Cairo Declaration. Um, and I, I, to my mind, this is something which was added on to pacify the literalists, because from a literalist perspective, uh, only God is sovereign. Uh, no organization like the OIC can possibly decide these sorts of things. Uh, God's law must uh, dominate over uh, human beings' law. Uh, and therefore, I think they, they threw that in, but they didn't. In other words, there's absolutely no specific connection between the two. It's just that Article 11a says no slavery. And then there's this kind of general provision about all the human rights in the declaration that, of course, uh, we've got to be careful because, you know, Sharia might um, uh, you know, be stronger, so to speak, than this declaration. But it's not specific. In other words, they're not saying that any particular aspect of Sharia would, con would contradict any particular uh, part of the declaration. But it's quite unsatisfactory because it leaves, it leaves the status of the declaration rather in midair. You know, it's not entirely sure, it's not entirely clear how, you know, how seriously one, one should take it. Thank you. And what's your view on the contemporary understanding of slavery amongst more conservative Muslims? Have you, have, has there been a study or have you been on top of, you know, the, the contemporary view? Are, are there many scholars or most scholars who still think it is allowed or uh, technically, even if not pragmatically, because there isn't any? Or do you think it's not the case? Like, what's your general view? Yeah, I think one of the things which uh, actually I think Jonathan Brown does say, because I've seen it written somewhere else, and uh, Bernard uh, Freeman says as well, is that slavery is remarkably um, unimportant in the overall pattern of debates about uh, Islamic law. Um, of course, it's possible that people say that because they're specialists in slavery, and so they... Um, they're annoyed at not seeing it being debated more within general debates. But I think, I think there probably is a sense in which slavery is um, not debated very much. Uh, and often this is because it's seen as embarrassing. In fact, I've called one of my chapters, The Embarrassing Institution. This is something I've lifted from 
uh, another author, an American author. Um, and so, uh, as you say, one of the one of the classic things if people are asked is to say, oh, well, it doesn't exist anymore, so why debate it? Right? Uh, it's been abolished by uh, all countries in the world. There isn't a single country in the world which um, has slavery on the statute book uh, currently, as far as I know anyway. Um, and therefore it's irrelevant. We don't need to, to, to debate it. So there is a sense in which uh, contemporary debates, say on the internet or, or what have you, um, tend to just say, well, it's irrelevant. We're not going to talk about it. Having said that, because of ISIS and because of the enslavement um, by ISIS of, of people that they captured, and also in fact, before that, um, there were uh, some examples of um, Shi militias in southern Iraq who were also enslaving people. Um, I think then on the grounds that they were apostates, they were bad Muslims. Um, the, 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 there's been a sort, sort of resurgence. And there's also, of course, the constant problems that you get in places like Mauritania, where people go and, you know, journalists go and say, oh, but the law is not being applied. Uh, slavery uh, still uh, continues. So. Although people try and say it's not relevant anymore, there's still a, a constant stream of information or, or news which says, but actually it is important. Now, on top of that, you get people who say, well, it doesn't really matter if it's disappeared entirely. Um, Muslims need to work out whether it was Ahmad Khan or Amir Ali who was right about slavery. In other words, is, is it true, like Ahmad Khan said, that Muslims have sinned, in effect, ever since the foundation of their religion by keeping slavery? Or is it true, like Amir Ali says, that actually this was a pragmatic thing, uh, you couldn't do it straight away, it was not possible to abolish it straight away, but there was always this sort of sense that eventually the conditions would be right. And this, this is quite important because um, it does you know, make a difference to your view of Islamic history um, and of uh, Islamic justice and, and so on and so forth. So th 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 this is another level of debate uh, which comes out uh, from time to time uh, in some of these polemics. So in other words, there's not a single debate. There are a series of different debates, uh, some of which are intensely practical. What do we do about Mauritania? Uh, and some of which are very abstract and have to do with um, you know, how has the Muslim community behaved itself, so to speak, since since the foundation of Islam? And those those are very different levels of debate. Um, two related questions. One is, um, so based on what you're saying, is it mainly uh, a minority of literalists who they are uh, for the concept of slavery? Uh, and second, perhaps uh, different or perhaps related is, on that viewpoint, I think that you mentioned right at the end, uh, with regards to Amir Ali versus um, uh, Sayyid Ahmed Khan, is the question of Sayyid Ahmed Khan, how, how did he justify the, um, you know, early companions from the Sunni tradition at least, kept slaves? What, what, mm -hmm. Within the Sunni tradition at least, they would be quite difficult to justify the first companions keeping slaves, given that's against the, the, the rule. And I think yeah. within the Shia framework, imams kept um, slaves. So ha, ha, yeah. uh, I, I think it would be quite difficult to understand that. So g given from a Shia perspective, they were seen as infallible. Um, yes. uh, them keeping slaves would make it very difficult to say it's inherently impossible to be okay. So uh, what's your view on that? I guess yeah. this is a different question. Yeah, let me just say first about literalists. Yes, it is, a, it is the literalists who are saying that slavery should not have been abolished and that uh, it is wrong and can't. I mean, that human beings cannot abolish part of God's law. Yes, that's very much a literalist perspective. Uh, Muslims from any other um, perspective would, would not um, take that position. But on, your, on the second question, is, this actually is very complicated. And it's possible, I hadn't actually thought about this, it's possible that the fact that Ahmed Khan came from a, a Sunni background and Amir Ali came from a a Shi background, this may actually be of some significance in this in this debate. Um, it, it was easier, as you say, for Ahmad Khan to say, well, you know, the companions of the Prophet were not um, infallible. Um, they did things wrong, and you know, this perhaps was one of the things that, that, that they did wrong. Whereas if you're dealing with uh, the infallible 12 Imams, although infallibility is a complicated concept but anyway I mean it that does actually you're right does actually make it uh, more difficult to say that uh, 
this was wrong uh, from the very beginning. There's been some quite sort of, um, what's, what's the word, quite arcane uh, splitting of hairs in this debate by looking at the tense in which it, the verb occurs in the Quran. The, the, the euphemism which is often used in the Quran for slaves is uh, that which your right hand possesses. And that's how it's usually translated. Um, but it's been argued by followers of Ahmad Khan that actually um, the verb is in the, is in the past tense. It's a, basically an aorist. And so you should actually translate it, that which your right hand possessed. And therefore, um, I, this is the argument, therefore, from the moment that the prophet uh, revealed this, um, the possessed was in the past and it was no longer valid for the, for the present and the future. Um, I, I personally, I, I find that a little bit tricky because in, in Arabic, the, the, the past is the, uh, the standard uh, uh, tense and I'm not sure that you can really translate it that way, but it just shows you how, how complicated and, and perhaps sometimes perhaps a bit bizarre these arguments can, can become um, uh, over, over these textual things. But definitely it is a more Sunni thing, I think, to, to consider that perhaps, yes, even the companions of the Prophet, um, you know, didn't get it right and, 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 and behaved in ways which were not entirely acceptable. Yeah. Um, well, um, thank you very much. Um, another question that's come through is, is a pragmatic question. Um, do you think it's um, the, the law which has led to um, action? So has it been the scholars which have caused abolition? Or has it really, you can tell it's only one of the full drivers, but is it the pragmatic reality on the ground which has been the real driver? I think the real driver for abolition has been secular legislation. So in other words, for, for, for abolitionist law, right? So uh, various colonial regimes often actually quite reluctantly and often pushed by Christian missionaries and pushed by various pressure groups at home, uh, colonial governments did eventually screw up their courage to formally, legally uh, abolish slavery. Sometimes with all sorts of ifs and buts and uh, German abolition, for instance, said that uh, domestic slavery in places like Tanzania and Cameroon, which both had quite large Muslim populations, uh, domestic slavery was exempt. And, you know, what does that mean? I mean, what is domestic slavery and so on and so forth? So, um, the, the, but the laws were secular laws. They were not religious laws. Um, and in a sense, what's then happened, and this is true also, as I said, of Muslim countries. So if you look at Afghanistan, if you look at Persia or Iran, uh, or, or Turkey, uh, these are all, ve and Turkey, very secular, because this was done under Atatürk. Um, these are couched in the language of secularism. So what I'm arguing is that there's then a catch-up process which has to happen so that these laws on the statute book actually become things that people believe are right, as opposed to just being things that the government says you have to do. Um, and it's there, it's in that second, it's in that catch up process that I think the, the Islamic abolitionists have had such an important role. It's in, in persuading Muslims that actually the law is, is right, the law is not uh, incorrect. And of course, there's a long and complicated um, debate about particularly whether colonial laws uh, should ever be obeyed uh, by Muslims. Um, and usually the ulama say, as long as the intention, the niyat is right, uh, then you can obey um, colonial laws, uh, even though they're not um, addicted by, by Muslims. Although, you know, there are differences in, in approach to that as well. Uh, so it, it's in that, in that sense that, that the intention is right. It's, it's in, at the moment that people say, well, the intention of abolitionist legislation is right, that the law becomes acceptable and becomes then, of course, then also becomes socially, socially enforced as opposed to just enforced by the police and the army, which is a very inefficient way of enforcing anything. Um, as we've got hundreds of examples of laws which are unenforceable, basically, um, which, 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 you know, um, as soon as the population begins to think the law is right, then you can enforce the law much more easily. So um, my argument is that, that this second process of turning formal legislation into lived reality is where the reformers are really important. Thank you. And so um, 
link to that directly. It, it, so are you saying that it's Muslims who have basically pushed almost the scholars who think because it's become socially acceptable, because the secular law basically had things in place, and that that was a big almost facilitator for scholars to rethink and re-examine their approach, which fundamentally sometimes has large theological implications if one were to say that, um, you know, the imams can do something wrong, whatever, that theological implication require rethinking of a whole you know, way of deriving law. Um, so do you think it, which way around, that, or do you think, so what what drove the, the scholars to change their minds? Or what drove the people to change? Like you also mentioned earlier that people change their minds or acceptance happened because internal scholarship sort of justified it. So which way around do you think people got moved by? I, that's a really difficult question. And the problem is that you have to look at it in each individual case. Uh, it's very hard to generalize. But what I would say is that the uh, dominant uh, scholarship tends to say that um, it was secular legislation, whether by colonialists or, or by independent states, it was secular legislation which pushed the scholars to re-examine their beliefs. Now, there's obviously some truth to that, but what I'd like to argue is that that's by no means the whole truth. In other words, there are independent and autonomous um, questionings of slavery, which go right back in Islamic history. Um, people quote the old texts uh, and say, you know, well, this uh, scholar in the 13th century or something said something which, so these are not, it's not just, it's not just a response to secular legislation. Um, I don't want to say that secular leg legislation is totally unimportant because that would be wrong as well. But there's a kind of complicated interplay whereby a secular law is made that slavery should be abolished. And then people say, ah, yes, but wait a second, we'd already you know, argued that this was necessary, or, or some of us had anyway, uh, in the past. Um, let's go back to these texts, let's see what they say, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And I think the other thing I should perhaps say is that I've, I've made this sort of crude distinction between secular law and, and religious uh, explanation, but actually, Sometimes, like if you take the case of the Sultanate of Zanzibar in East Africa, where the British government undoubtedly put a lot of pressure on the Sultan of Zanzibar to abolish slavery, at first the slave trade and then slavery. But the actual decree of abolition is a fascinating document because, well, first of all, the British aren't mentioned in it at all. But the Sultan, has, I don't think he's done it himself, I think he's got some ulama to make a kind of reasoned Islamic defense of why slavery should be abolished. So although in a formal sense, all the histories of, of um, uh, Zanzibar say the British forced the Sultan to abolish slavery, and that in a sense is true, but in a substantive sense, in terms of the way in which the justification for abolition is presented in the Sultan's decree, it's actually a very Islamic document. Now, this varies tremendously. So you get the abolition in uh, Qatar, for instance, in 1952, I think, quite late, um, where there's not a mention of Islam. Um, you know, it's a purely secular state decision. So in other words, even the legislation itself varies uh, from case to case. And what one has to do, I think, is to look very carefully in each case, uh, where does the legislation come from? How is it couched? How is it explained? How is it attacked? How is it criticized? How is it? Why do people rebel against it in, in many cases? Um, why do they then cease to rebel against it? Um, and this is a, a compl long, complicated, layered history. But in, in that process, I think that reforming ulama, and I think here perhaps Muhammad Abdu and Abdu's networks may in fact be more important than the more flamboyant Ahmad Khan and Amir Ali who were you know, public intellectuals who were very well known, who had lots of followers, and Abdul was a much more, uh, much more, what's the word, much more modest man, a much more working more behind the scenes and more, uh, and, you know, trying to find some formulation which would be acceptable to as many people as possible, um, 
and it's possible that really his his network was more influential. I mean, I'm, I'm just guessing here, but certainly in certain cases anyway, uh, in getting people to uh, accept over time that slavery was wrong. Um, so uh, there's a lot of research to be done. And in a way, I think it's a bit unfortunate. So much research has been done in the early period. Uh, I would say that because I'm a modernist. And what I would like to see is more research on the modern period and on these modern reformers and uh, what their impact was. Um, uh, I think final question because I think we're, we're coming. We just actually reached uh, Maghreb uh, time for Maghreb. Um, uh, in terms of the type of slavery and the rationale for abolition. So, um, on the type of slavery, the question that's come is: um, Is there a question about the modern type of slavery being different to historical slavery? Um, in the sense that you could, the argument that this person I think is making is that historical slavery was almost master and slave, whereas today there's an element of Slightly different uh, information, perhaps those of the intended. So, is that something that plays a role um, in the difference? And the, the second question what is the driving rationale that Muslim scholars have put from a traditional Muslim perspective on, on its full abolition um, rather than a, a tailored one through, through time? What is the big rationale, the driver behind it? Yeah, no, I think that's a very important point, actually, that um, slavery is often seen as an economic phenomenon. Uh, I started my own research thinking of it as an economic phenomenon, uh, but actually it's not. And it's it's a social phenomenon, which sometimes has very major economic uh, impact and sometimes has none at all. It's just a social phenomenon. Um, and so um, it's, it is actually quite important to look at when people resist the abolition of slavery, uh, why are they resisting? And sometimes it's because their livelihoods are being um, undermined. Um, if you're um, if you're a, an Omani ivory trader in East Africa uh, in the late 19th century, um, your view is that you need slaves to to bring the ivory uh, to to the coast. Um, and actually, a lot of this ivory was brought by by free porters. But uh, nevertheless, you probably couldn't have got as much if you hadn't had some uh, slave porters as well. So in other words, uh, in, some, in some circumstances, the opposition to abolition uh, can be a very economic one. And the ulama can pick up on this and they can say, uh, it isn't right to destroy the livelihood of the faithful uh, in this way. Um, at other times, uh, it's nothing to do with that. And if we look at the modern day, of course, it's not on the whole an economic phenomenon. It's true that some Muslims have kept uh, domestic slaves who work for them uh, in household chores. And there's been some scandals in, in London, for instance, on this. But um, by and large, it, it, on the internet, the overwhelming majority of the questions are about concubines, right? So why, uh, why can I not have a concubine? What, what is the legitimate um, Islamic situation in terms of having concubines? And sort of thing. So, in that sense, the, the the modern thing is completely different. And some of what the ulama are putting up is to do with what I mentioned right at the very beginning. Um, if there are certain sins, I've forgotten what they are now, I'm afraid. But there are certain sins that you can only expiate uh, through freeing a slave. Uh, you can't do that if there's no slaves to free. Um, and so you get that 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 kind of argument being made. But it's not an economic argument at all. It's an argument uh, to do with social arrangements uh, in case of concubinage or to do with um, purely religious uh, things in the case of how do you how do you, uh, you know, atone for something that you've that you've done so in other words it, it is it is actually quite important again if we're looking at the actual process of actual abolition in different places it's very important to, to see how slaves are being used because that really um, reflects on how people respond to uh, to abolition. And if in fact slaves are no longer of any use for anything, for instance, and were very economically useful, then you often find that people give up trying to defend slavery because they actually don't need it anymore. So uh, I'm, that's being a bit cynical, but um, you, you do have to distinguish different motives and different levels of motive um, for, for all of this. There is a very secular argument about slavery that it holds back societies, it divides them, it, um, it, it makes them less capable of functioning uh, 
in a way to develop uh, rapidly. And so that's a, a kind of socio-political argument, uh, which is again different. So in other words, um, these debates are very fragmented and the realities to which they address themselves are very fragmented too. Uh, and one's always got to bear that in mind. At the very highest level of abstraction, there is there are questions which are in a sense eternal, uh, which are to do with theology and, 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 and things like that. But, but there are lots and lots and lots of sub-arguments uh, which are very different and very complicated. Thank you very much. Um, there actually were, were, was one other question on a uh, comparison of Islam and other faiths uh, on, on this issue a bit more. Uh, and it, I don't know whether I should... Too, yeah, if you can do a quick answer then I think that would be great. Yeah. Um, Ah, <laughs> uh -huh. yes. Um, well, Bernard Freeman is very good on this, actually. His recent book on uh, Islamic abolition is definitely worth reading on that. Um, I, the, very often the closest parallels are with the Abrahamic faiths, so with Judaism and, and Christianity, um, because a lot of the assumptions are similar between the Abrahamic faiths. Uh, having said that, uh, there is a distinct different story in each case. Um, I'm also often asked which civilization had the most slaves, uh, the Islamic or the Christian. In fact, I think my idea is that it was the Chinese who had the most slaves, and yet hardly anybody talks about Chinese slavery. It's one of these really um, poorly researched areas, and many modern Chinese scholars would say that they didn't have slaves, that were using the wrong word. So here we're back to semantics again, which is quite important in these debates. Um, and it, it does make it very difficult to compare different uh, civilizations or different religions. If you take Hinduism, for instance, the seepage between servile status and caste status makes it extremely difficult to compare. Uh, what are we really dealing with here? Are we dealing with something which is actually mainly about caste or, or something which is mainly to do with slavery? Um, so much as I love these comparisons and I engage in them, they're actually very hard to do. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry we have actually run over a little bit, but thank you so much for your time. It was a, a real pleasure to listen to you. And um, and, and, and I think the Q&A session in particular was was very great and, and, and really engaging with, with the audience. So thank you so much for that as well. Um, just a couple of quick announcements for everyone else. Uh, we continue to do our Zoom um, lectures online. We on our uh, which you can find out on sikkim.org.uk on our website. We have tafsir classes, um, Quran tafsir classes on Mondays at 9 a.m., um, which happen every week, and they're currently um, on the tafsir of the third chapter of the Quran. Um, next week, actually, the talk has been cancelled, was by Professor Renu in Modest Fashion, Commerce, uh, Community and Community, uh, but that will be arranged for later on. We are um, organizing the talk next week now, and the week after we have uh, um, we are planning to have this uh, on uh, in person for a small number of people. Uh, we will be sharing more information about that over this weekend. Um, and that will be with totally socially distancing on one way system. A number of tools have to be pre registered in advance, so please do watch out for that. Um, uh, we will also be having it online for those who wish to follow the Eid prayers online. Um, so thank you very much for everyone and look forward to hearing from you and uh, joining next uh, next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Good.